All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Luis Gomez. I'm here with the Community Language Cooperative as a Spanish interpreter. And today we're going to establish language justice in this space by using a simultaneous interpretation feature through Zoom. Once we activate it, you'll see a small globe appear on the bottom right hand of your screen if you're joining us through a computer. If this morning you're joining us with a cell phone or a tablet, you can select the three dots option where it says more. And right there, you'll be able to find the interpretation feature. So you can select if you wish to participate in English or in Spanish. This just allows everyone to be able to listen, ask questions, participate all in the same way, and to be able to do so in the language of their heart, the language that they speak with their families. Muy buenos días, mi nombre es Luis Gómez, estoy aquí con la Cooperativa Comunitaria de Lenguaje como intérprete de español. El día de hoy vamos a establecer justicia lingüística en este espacio utilizando una función de interpretación simultánea a través de Zoom. Ya, cual, ya que la activemos, verán un pequeño globo terráqueo en la parte de la derecha de abajo de su pantalla si se une por una computadora. Si esta mañana se une con un teléfono celular o una tableta, podrá seleccionar los tres puntos donde dice más y la función de interpretación aparecerá ahí. Ahí podrá seleccionar si desea participar en español o en inglés para todos poder comunicarnos, hacer preguntas de la misma manera en el idioma de nuestro corazón, el que hablamos con nuestras familias. Si en cualquier momento tiene alguna pregunta o algún problema durante la reunión, nos podemos comunicar por el chat, activaremos la función de interpretación, verificaremos que ambos canales funcionen y estaremos listos. And if at any point throughout the meeting you have any issues or any questions with the interpretation feature, we can communicate via the chat. We will now turn on interpretation and just please remember to make a language selection. Thank you so much. Okay, we're all set. Thank you. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Louise, and welcome and thank you for that. Uh, good morning and welcome to the first community network meeting of 2021. My name is Patrice Hawkins and I'm the Deputy Executive Director of the Community Impact and Strategic Planning Team here at Denver Human Services. So we are so excited to have you join us this Friday morning to kick off what I believe will be a year that can embody hope, progress, and increased collaboration across all of our teams and agencies. So many of you know that DHS held several community conversations with community-based organizations and Denver residents in January and February to hear directly from you. Some of the feedback we heard was that it's important to continue holding space for all of us to come together to share updates, resources, and network in real time. If you didn't get the report out from the community conversations, please drop a re uh, request um, in your contact information in the chat, and we'll just make sure that you can get a copy. We have it available in English and Spanish, and there's some helpful data and information in there about how folks are experiencing communities right now. So earlier this year, we also asked for your feedback about the community network meetings in a survey. Thank you for taking that survey. Your input has been extremely helpful, and so we have made some adjustments we hope you will like. So first, we will now meet monthly in a virtual environment with a focus on the issues that are important to you right now and in your neighborhood. Second, every quarter we will host DHS specific sessions where we will spend a little more time on program and advocacy updates. Between these sessions, we will host topic-based discussions based on your suggestions as an opportunity to pass the mic um, to our community partners who are deeply ingrained in the work. We hope to provide breakout sessions as well at these meetings so that you can better network and ask questions directly to the experts about those things that you are grappling with on particular uh, issues or topics that you're facing. And finally, a member of our community impact team, Katie Ziegler, will host these meetings as the MC and serve as a point of contact for you. So please let her know if you have questions about the topics or feedback on how this experience is going. And our amazing Kathy Crusan Ford will remain our rock star trainer um, and continue to provide all kinds of helpful DHS program updates. So before I hand it over, I know you've seen the agenda and we have some great speakers joining today on legislative issues to updates on our marketing and communications. And I also want to say how thrilled I am that we have Rebecca Martinez from HOST and Nicole Fuller from DHS as guest speakers today. So I, I've worked closely with both and their passion and commitment to responding in times of need and their expertise on the topics they will cover today is unmatched. 
I hope you will ask questions and consider them as assets to your work. And I see we have our very own Rachel Flank Goldberg, our grants manager, closing us out with some exciting news on community impact grant opportunities. So thank you again for joining us today, for helping us kick off 2021 in this first meeting. Um, have fun and I'll hand it over to Katie Ziegler for the next part of the meeting and welcome. Hi, thanks everyone. It's so nice to meet you all virtual in a virtual setting. I'm really excited to be kicking off these community network meetings. Um, we have a few different changes about how we're gonna be advertising these meetings and how you can add them to your calendar. So please bear with us as we're learning new landscapes and new technology to be able to make that happen. Um, so I'm just gonna do a quick brief overview about how you can add these events to your calendar through our community network digest that goes out um, every Monday. And Kathy will speak a little bit about that piece um, when we get to her section as well. But for right now, if you have received the community digest, um, you will just go into that and it'll say, visit our website. There'll be a link that says to visit your website. You will be brought to a page that says our next meeting. And then there's a button down here that says, visit the event page to add to your calendar. And you'll hit this button and then there will be a button here at the top that says add to calendar at that point in time it'll send you an invite to your email and you can add it into your calendar that way um, so please just be patient with us as we navigate the best ways of doing that but for right now um, that is how we are going to be doing that and then feel free to forward that event to whomever you feel is um, a good fit for that piece and Kathy will talk a little bit more about the Community Digest and how we've changed how we're communicating with our partners and all of the wonderful information that you've been giving to Kathy for years. Um, so she'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. I am going to hand it over to David who will be giving us some marketing updates. All right, thank you, Katie. I am, there we go. I'm also doing some behind the scenes, so I'm, I'm kind of doing a few things at once. Good morning, community partners uh, and uh, DHS colleagues. It's great to see you this April. This is Child Abuse Prevention Month, uh, which is why I have the little pinwheel here. I don't know if I gestured the right way. Hopefully I did. Um, we're glad to have you here. Uh, I see Christopher smiling, so it tells me I might be doing something right. Um, but we are so glad to have you here on this, this uh, Zoom platform. We hope that it is something that uh, really breaks down barriers of our community uh, that we can meet them where they are, which is what we're about at DHS. Um, we do want everyone to be uh, connected, supported, safe and well, and Child Abuse Prevention Month is exactly uh, what that's about. And of course, we care about children all year uh, long, but this month is a very special one that the, uh, the, the community at large uh, recognizes by planting pinwheels and Although we don't have all those things happening uh, this month because of the pandemic, we do want to just remember um, how we can uh, support um, child abuse prevention. Uh, so, that, so that's a, a main thing. The other thing I wanted to talk to you about today is that April is the, uh, the last month for LEAP. Um, I know it's nice warm weather now, but that is something that can help some people who are behind on their bills, um, as well as um, uh, property Denver property tax relief program for the 2019 uh, program year. Uh, this is the last month uh, for that. Um, and then finally, I'd like to say as the weather's getting nice and things uh, to remind you about our Explorer Pass. And I, I want to make sure I read this right because it's so so good. Um, as low as one dollar admission per person, up to ten people at area museums and cultural centers. As those things are now opening up. Uh, folks could call the centers or visit them online uh, before uh, getting their reservation, but it's a great way to get out of the house with your family. And we just want to um, stand beside these wonderful uh, partners that are um, really trying to help the clients that we serve daily um, have, have some joy. So, so those are the updates I have uh, for today. I do encourage you to listen greatly to the people who are going to be speaking. They have some great information for you, and I hope everyone has a good Saturday. Thank you. Thanks so much, David. All right, we're going to pass it over to our very own Lauren Harvey for some legislative and advocacy updates. Good morning, everybody. It's great to see some of you and um, join this call today. Thank you for letting me 
take some of your time on a Friday morning. Um, I'm just going to share a very short presentation um, regarding our state legislature and some bills that are <clears throat> um, of note and pertinent to our work and to the folks we serve. So let me go ahead and get that open. Um, so I did want to start this morning with just a couple legislative updates. And um, for those of you who may not know, in Colorado, our state legislature is currently in session as we speak. Um, they are not quite halfway through their session yet. So by our constitution, the Colorado legislature meets for 100 days, 120 days total every year. Um, this year, the schedule is a little bit off. They took um, some needed time off in January to um, let folks, uh, the, our state legislators get vaccinated and to try to prevent um, further spread of COVID-19. So um, due to the pandemic, the, the schedule is a little bit different this year for the legislature, but they're uh, not quite halfway through and they will be working through early June on um, all sorts of uh, different <clears throat> bills and, and important funding um, for the state. This morning, I'm going to discuss just a couple bills at the state level, um, but I will tell you a kind of fun fact. So far, there have actually been over 460 bills already introduced at our state legislature. So lots of work going, going on under the Golden Dome downtown. Um, this morning, I'm just focusing on a couple bills that are especially pertinent to um, the work we do at Denver Human Services and, the, and some of the folks we serve. Um, so two of these bills, the first one is House Bill 21184, which looks at driver's licenses for foster children. Um, this is a bill that the city and county of Denver supports. Um, and for reference, the city and county of Denver does take positions on uh, certain bills um, as, a, as a city as a whole. Um, our agency does not do that, though we do provide um, recommendations and thoughts on bills. And so what House Bill 21184 does is it clarifies statute and provides funding to facil facilitate greater access to driver's education and to driver's licenses for foster youth. Um, <clears throat> the bill would clarify some issues around liability and would also provide um, additional resources to county departments to pay for driver's education for foster youth. Unfortunately, that can sometimes be a barrier to uh, getting a driver's license because of the cost of that. And there are limited resources um, in, this er in this area. And so if there are further resources we could provide um, to help some of these foster youth get uh, driver's education classes and help facilitate them getting their driver's license, it's certainly something that's important to any young person as I'm sure some of you um, probably know from personal experience if you have children. Um, and especially for foster youth, being able to get a driver's license uh, can provide that sense of normalcy to them and also helps them foster some independence, just like for any young person. Um, so we do support this bill and we're happy to see the, <clears throat> the resources and the support it would provide for foster children. Um, another bill also geared towards foster youth, House Bill 21 1094 looks at foster youth in transition program. And what this uh, bill would do would be to provide resources and support for former foster youth who have exited foster care. Now, why this is really important, as you can imagine, um, in cases when a foster youth emancipates from foster care at age 18, and they leave the foster care system, which uh, they do have the option to stay and continue to be in foster care and receive, and receive supports. But should they choose to leave, you know, they have their own independence they want to seek. Um, just like for any young person, they might find themselves in need of some supports and some help. Um, going out into the world is a big deal. And um, <clears throat> some folks, you know, you might think you're ready, but you might need a little bit of support. And so for these particular former foster youth, this bill would allow them to come back um, to the county department and say, yes, I do need some help. Maybe it's some housing help. Um, maybe it's some help paying some bills. Maybe it's help um, getting signed up for Medicaid, something like that. And so this bill would provide uh, the resources and the ability for us to support those former foster youth and make sure they can get services um, for whatever they might need to uh, continue their independence and to be successful into adulthood. Um, the city and county of Denver does support this bill. 
we in our department uh, worked on some amendments to the bill because we wanted to ensure that there was an appropriate balance for these youth, that they can get supports and services, but also still uh, achieve independence and feel that they are independent. Our experience with these uh, foster youth is that they may not be eager to rejoin a system, but they are in need of some support. So that so we hope that that would strike the balance of ensuring they have independence, but also the support that they need. So those are just a couple bills I wanted to highlight from the state legislative perspective that we think are really important um, for the folks we serve and for these uh, foster youth. I also wanted to highlight at the federal level, uh, federal COVID relief that many of you are probably aware of that passed uh, last month, now that we're in April, it's last month. Uh, so House Resolu Resolution 1319 is called the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. This bill was signed into law by President Biden on March 11th, and it is a $1.9 trillion federal package that builds upon some of the legislation and funding from last year to provide um, funding and supports to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic that began last year. Um, the bill includes a number of items of support. Um, namely, many of you are probably aware, this bill does include um, the stimulus checks that folks are receiving as individuals or families. The bill also provides funding for childcare assistance, supplemental nutrition assistance program funding, unemployment assistance, uh, funding for local government response to the pandemic, among many other things. Um, we are very happy to see that the federal government is continuing to provide this support to Americans during the pandemic. In Colorado, we know that the economy has recovered better than expected. However, we also know that um, lower income individuals have been disproportionately impacted by the economic downturn. And so we do believe these resources are very necessary. Um, what we don't know yet is exactly how some of this will play out at the state level. Uh, we have heard that Colorado anticipates receiving approximately $3.9 billion total from that funding. And that we know that the General Assembly will have the power to appropriate that funding. Um, and I believe they will be working in partnership with the governor. Uh, the governor and uh, state legislative leadership have identified some areas of priority, uh, namely small supporting small businesses, infrastructure, mental health, affordable housing, supports for rural Colorado and develop, developing the workforce. So it's yet to be seen exactly how much funding will go where and how it will be used. But I do think we can anticipate there will be investments um, in a number of areas to support um, those priorities and to support Coloradans in general who may have suffered from the pandemic. Um, I would be happy to follow up with anyone with any further information on any of the items I've touched upon, but um, I'm I am happy to have had time to talk with you this morning and please do let me know if there are any questions or comments. Thank you so much and I will stop sharing my screen now. Thank you so much, Lauren. We're so excited to be able to have you a part of these meetings um, for the DHS update meetings moving forward. We think it's just gonna be such a great asset and resource um, for all of our community partners. So please feel free to reach out to Lauren if you have questions about um, those items there. Uh, next up, we have our very own Kathy Christian Ford and Chris Jorgensen with uh, Catch Up with Kathy and Chris. Um, I know that you guys know Kathy very well, so I will let Kathy and Chris take it away from here. Hello, I'm gonna have Christopher introduce himself first. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, hey guys. Oh, hold on. Can you hear me? There we go. Um, <laughs> my name is Christopher Jorgensen. I'm an outreach case coordinator uh, with CORE at Human Services. I'm glad to see all of you. Um, it's good to see some familiar faces and some new, and I'm super excited to uh, have this new format. Um, and yeah, uh, we'll see how it all goes. Thanks. Great. And I'm Kathy Cruz Sanford. I've been with the agency for 14 years, trainer for nine years. And first off, we want to talk about our Community Digest newsletter that has gone out since actually February 12th. And the bottom line is this. There was issues with me sending out all those individual emails that you used to receive two to three times a day. And I wanted to be able to share information. Well, our tech services has mentioned that it was compromising our domain. So anything coming out of denvergov.org potentially would go into your junk email, which is not good news. 
So that being said, we decided to work on this Community Digest newsletter for now. And it'll talk about federal information, it'll talk about some of the state information and also the county information. We hope in the future though, to provide a listserv that you as a partner will be able to send your information to this email and then it will go out to the distribution list. So stay tuned, that's coming. But in the meantime though, as I mentioned, we have our Community Digest newsletter that it will be going out every Monday and Craig Wells from our communications and marketing department is doing an amazing job compiling all that. If you are not on uh, the Digest newsletter uh, distribution list, I put in chat Katie's email. You could also reach out to me. I can get that email in the chat as well. So that's a little bit about the Community Digest newsletter, and that will highlight these meetings and other important information like what David had also mentioned and any changes that are coming from the federal government. So that being said, unless Chris has anything else to mention, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and talk about some of the changes that seem to happen every single month. And um, like I said, staying on top of it can be difficult, but I wanted you to see your screen and let's see if my internet is working. Yep, it's gone. <laughs> so changes, I love when that happens, Chris, right? Yeah. So the public health emergency, as you remember, it's been almost a year. And in April of last year, actually it was the end of March, they made the decision that anybody that was on Health First Colorado, Colorado's Medicaid program or Children's Health Plan Plus would be basically locked in. And so what is a lock in? Again, it means otherwise you might have been terminated, maybe for being over income. It has locked you in and it continues to be um, the public health emergency will continue. As a matter of fact, they were updates on March 1st. And it's supposed to be extended through December 2021. Now, that being said, the federal government is supposed to do it on a 90 day increments. So after the next 90 days and so on and so forth. But the good news is it, look lo it looks like it's going to continue through the end of December. What I also wanted to do and put in chat is this hyperlink on the left hand side for you as eligibility sites or community partners, you could always go into that link and find out the latest and greatest information. So I'm gonna add that to the chat and you can go again, when you get an opportunity, go check it out. So good news for a lot of our clients, especially need, that need this care during this time. This is another component that was put in place actually in January, and it's through healthcare policy and financing, also called HICPUF, and it's the um, remote application assistance. So a lot of our assisters, I would say CAS site, certified application assistance site, we have medical assistance sites, we've got presumptive eligibility sites, and so on. They now have the ability to do that paper application via telephone or video conferencing. And this is only during the public health emergency. So that's important that you understand that. Also, I can provide to you with hyperlinks the information about the memo. I'll put that in there that goes into greater detail. And then I will also put in chat the fillable acknowledgement of receipt of verbal consent form. You say that three times fast, right? <laughs> so I know Christopher, right? So I'm gonna put that also in chat, the direct links to those documents. One other piece they talk about is when you are doing this, you wanna make sure that you as an assister will sign your own name as on both the authorization form and the application. Now here's the other piece. They really try to promote having you use Peak with your clients as much as possible because then you can upload these documents via Peak. However, if a client does not have their case number, the 1B case number, they don't have that account, you may not be able to do that and you would have to send those documents directly to the county. If you need ha any help with that concerning Peak, you have the email here um, as well as the phone number and the Peak Outreach team. Um, do a great job with this as well. If you need to reach out to them, you could reach out to me. Another piece that's important is the waiver for interviews. Last year, during the beginning days of COVID, we had made a decision, federally they made a decision and allowed for waivers in each state and then each county to be able to waive doing that 
interview because it was very hard for, I would say, our chronically homeless population not being able to get a hold of them. We needed to get people food. And so that was in place for quite a few months. Then we went back to doing the interviewing. Now we have stopped that again. And so that being said, any food assistance applications coming in to Denver County through June 2021, and that's applications and recertification packets, we will not require that interview. If there are questionable information or we don't have everything we need, we're gonna send out a verification checklist. But the idea is this, to get folks food. We need to be able to help them do this. And so this is important that you know that. Another new component that happened last year was recertification packets are typically due at six months. And then again, there's a 24 month search. I know I can go into the weeds on food assistance, but that being said, right now, Denver County is extending it again. It's like an auto re-enroll. So what'll happen is for food assistance, if they have a recertification packet that's due March 31st um, through June 30th, it's gonna push it out. So it's either five or six months into the future. So the next one is not gonna be due till September 30th. And again, that helps a lot of our clients that aren't able to get that packet to us. Again, we're getting folks the, the help that they need. The emergency allotments, okay. This is potentially continuing through September, 2021. And what has been happening is in the beginning of the month, the folks will get their usual allotment, and then within a week, there'd be a bump to get them up to the maximum amount. So it's on a almost like a month by month uh, basis. And we just got word yesterday, by the way, that this is going to be rolling out again, good news, but it may take two weeks. So that first um, bump may not happen till after the 10th or later. So please tell your clients again, to anticipate getting that maximum allotment, but it may take a while. And again, the federal government makes this determination and gives us guidance. So this is some material, the SNAP alert, and we'll be putting that out in our community digest that goes out on Monday, as a matter of fact. So that's just an FYI for you. What else we got? Pandemic ABT. You can go to our website or the Colorado CDHS, and I'll put that out there as well for you to go because it's updated. The last update was on March 24th and they say, stay tuned. But last year when pandemic EBT came into play, any child that was in the uh, reduced or free lunch program, and if their parents were on food assistance, they automatically got this payment and it was $279 per child, which is amazing. So they're looking at doing it again, still working out the glitches, the state processes the pandemic EBT. So just to make sure you're aware of that, but stay tuned. And it's, they promise that it's gonna flow much better than it had before. So I wanted to make sure you were aware of that. What else do we got? So many changes. We continue to do tel telephonic signatures. So that being said, if a client turned in a paper application or a recertification packet and they didn't have their signature on it for food assistance, we as eligibility technicians can actually contact the client and do that uh, over the phone, basically this telephonic signature. So that's important. Otherwise in the past, we would have to send the document back. Then the client would have to send it back to us. Yeah, very frustrating. So some good coming out of uh, COVID. And then updates, our family and adult assistance division, they process most of our applications our changes, our recertifications, and I can tell you they have so much work they've had to do. So over the next two months, we're gonna be hiring in that division roughly 50 new staff to help process. And that in turn will help us concerning our call times and our call center. Um, it's a win-win for everybody, so stay tuned for that. Wanted to mention also our navigator training that we've been doing now for nine years. As I mentioned, over five, 6,000 individuals trained, over 350 organizations, we continue to do offer this training. And our dates are here right now in yellow. That means we are full. The June 16th class only has one slot available. 
I will put in chat the link for you to go and register if you like. Even if you've done it before, you can do it again. Every year, we talk about the changes with COVID. We also talk about any changes with other policies. And we talk about the entire Denver Human Services Division. So it includes assistance, protection, and operations. And so we go, um, a, a, not a deep dive, but stay tuned. We'll be rolling out DHS Navigator 2.0 and SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, will be the first topic that we cover with that, so I'm excited. All right, one more thing. Colorado Peak, the Peak Outreach Team from Boulder, actually has trained with me for nine years now, talking about Peak. We wanted to let you know that the Peak website is changing, and it's going to also be a better platform that you can actually use your phone now to apply, and I'm excited about that. As you know, you also can use my CO benefits to apply for food and cash assistance, but this is a change coming. That being said, they are offering some webinars here on April 8th and April 12th. And here I go again, I'm gonna go ahead and put those hyperlinks in there for you to register for both of those sessions because you will learn more about the PEAK website. We also are incorporating the changes into our Navigator training. So. That is pretty much it for me, Christopher. If you want to say anything else before we turn it over to Katie, let me know. Yeah, no, you you got it. Thank you so much for all those updates. And um, I'm looking forward to being able to update everyone here in the future. So enjoy the rest of the presentation. Yep, and you can catch up with Katie and or Katie, Katie too, but Chris <laughs> and Kathy and David and everyone else. So thank you so much. Thanks, Kathy. We're doing really great on our agenda right now. I was going to open it up just for the next couple of minutes for anybody who might have some questions for Kathy regarding um, those updates. If you'd like to pop them in the chat or come off mute, please feel free to do so. more seconds, see if anybody else has any questions. All righty. Well, hearing none, um, we'll go ahead and move on. So at the time when we set this agenda, the eviction moratorium was set to end um, at the end of March, March 31st, but that has since been extended until June. Um, 30th of this year, which is great. It's offering uh, people a little bit more time and protection from potentially being evicted. And so I have a colleague, Annalise, who just dropped a link into the chat there to talk a little bit more about that. Um, we originally had Rebecca Martinez from Host being able to present today, but she had an emergency, so uh, she won't be joining us. But feel free to take a look at that link and just figure out what the eviction moratorium extension um, is and how it could potentially affect your clients once we do reach that June 30th timeframe. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to DHS's Nicole Fuller to talk about rental assistance and how that works here at DHS um, for those who are maybe in that in-between of having a really hard time paying for rent. We know that housing costs are skyrocketing. And so this is a service we'd love to be able to spotlight. So Nicole, if you're ready, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Katie, I appreciate it. And thank you for inviting me to the meeting today and being able to spotlight my team's work in the community and what we do. Um, we are providing a service. I'm going to share my screen with you so you can see what we're up to. Uh, hopefully everyone can see that. So my team does emergency housing assistance. Um, normally we're at Castro or the East office providing this assistance, but we have of course modified our ways of doing business because of COVID. So we quickly um, created an online process um, so that people could uh, apply for rental assistance through um, the web. And so through 
our communications team, they were really great partners in creating a process that we hope is simple for people to access and use in order to um, get the rental assistance they need. So with no further ado, I will start the presentation. You pushed it twice. So these are the services that we offer through emergency housing assistance. So we used to be called general assistance. Some people may know us um, under that term. We changed that because people came to us for just about anything. And so the general term, I think, confused people. And so we came up with emergency housing assistance. Under this umbrella, we provide financial assistance, but we do not provide location assistance for um, participants that may need actual housing. So we just provide the financial piece. So I wanna make that clear so that people know and they can best serve their people in their community and at their agencies. So these are the folks that we can help. We can help only Denver County residents. So we have a lot of parts, a lot of Denver overlaps into other counties. So even though people live in the city of Denver, if they live in Arapahoe, Adams, Jefferson County, we cannot assist them. Um, it has to be Denver County um, homes or they have to live within Denver County in order to receive assistance. So we assist families or individuals. We will help homeless people. We will also um, help undocumented families, which is something that is unusual because a lot of people, um, a lot of agencies receive uh, federal dollars. And so they're not able to help the undocumented community. We are able to do that because these are local dollars that we have um, access to. And so anyone that you come across that may need rental assistance, please have them seek out our services. And we are also able to help homeowners with more mortgages. So I'll give you a little breakdown. Um, the rental assistance programs we have for deposit, eviction, first month's rent, and Excel, they have income limits. So the income limit for the three um, for those programs is 300% of the federal poverty level. Mortgage assistance, we recognize that um, a lot of people make more money, um, especially during this time of the pandemic. They were used to bringing in more money, and so they have a higher um, expense as far as their shelter is concerned. So in recognition of that, we increased the um, limit to 400% of the federal poverty level. And I have a flyer that I'd like to share with you so that you can see it. Um, so this is the difference that we have here. Um, the first column, and I will put this um, flyer in the chat box, um, is for the 300% federal poverty level. And then this one is specifically and only for mortgage assistance customers to give them um, more leeway and more room in that income guidance, um, income limit position. And the other piece to the income limits um, is that we only allow uh, rental or mortgage expense up to 60% of net income. It used to be gross, but we recognize that none of us take home our gross pay. So we decided to change this last year to net income. So people can pay up to 60% and we will um, help them in with their rent or mortgage. So these are basic requirements for all recipients of our services. So if a person applies, they have to provide the last 30 days of income. If they are newly employed, then they can just provide an employer statement and they have to have those um, additional pieces of information with the statement. They have to provide proof of resources and they have to provide picture IDs for all adults. For specifically deposit assistance, um, sorry, the um, 
We didn't used to do deposit assistance when this program first started. This program has been around for um, more than 35 years, if I'm if I remember correctly. And so they didn't used to do deposit assistance when this program first started. In the last um, five or so years, we have changed that and we have added deposit assistance as one of the services we can provide through the program. It is specifically for homeless, um, those folks who in our community that are experiencing homelessness. And so they can verify their homelessness in these ways. So a notice, um, an eviction notice that occurred within the last 60 days, a shelter letter from someone that they're working with in the community, um, or, and or motel receipts, which show that they've been staying at a Denver County um, a motel in Denver County. And then applicants have to be able to demonstrate that they can uh, maintain the unit on their own once we are able to help them get into the unit. First month's rent. Um, this is a service that we help to, we have to help people get into a new unit, um, particularly for folks that are in a unit that's unaffordable for them. We want to help people move into something that they can maintain and sustain with their current income. Um, recognizing that things change, have changed, particularly during COVID, um, we want to be um, a partner with people and help them be in a better spot. Their income still must be below the 300% federal poverty level. The unit cannot be above the 60% um, of their net income and demonstration of being able to afford the unit. And then they provide either an intent to rent letter, a lease agreement from the owner, the management company, or a leasing agent. And then for eviction, there is also something that we're kind of um, doing now, which we haven't had before, which is prevention and mortgage assistance. So these, these um, this applies to those three programs. So eviction, of course, is once someone has been served an eviction notice. Prevention is if someone is coming to us and they're applying for the following month. We've determined that people are kind of confused. And so if you have people that want to apply for assistance, just have them select eviction assistance if they're looking for assistance for next month. Um, and then there's mortgage assistance. So they have to have a verifiable emergency. So something had to occur in order for us to help them pay their rent. Um, there's examples on the slide, which I will share this with you guys and drop it in the chat. Um, they have to be able to demonstrate that they can maintain the unit. Um, unfortunately, we cannot cover lost or stolen money um, unless the person is able to demonstrate that they have filed a police report. Um, and uh, then they have to verify if they had funds, what, what happened to those funds? Did they use them for that emergency that is um, causing them the inability to pay the rent? Or what exactly happened? Um, because that is part of the eligibility determination. And they are required to provide a bank statement. So we also help with electricity um, and gas. So Excel assistance is a service that we also um, have added to our program. Um, so applicants should seek out LEAP assistance during that November to April um, period. And they should also reach out to Energy Outreach Colorado. Um, many times Energy Outreach Colorado can provide more assistance than we can. So we want them to access those services before um, accessing um, the Excel assistance through emergency housing systems. Um, and then they, they have to include an Excel bill and they have to show their payment history for the last 90 days. We want to see how people, um, if they've been able to pay their bill, if they've tried to pay something for it, or towards the bill and then try and give them resources um, in order to help them further their um, ability to pay. 
So COVID-19 presented some challenges for our program. Um, and so we kind of did away with the having to um, only paying one month of rent. If a person can demonstrate they have been impacted by COVID-19, then we can pay up to $3,000 for that person or cover three months of rent. And so that three month period would be either two months of back rent, the current month, or we can look forward, forward and do the current month and then two months forward or something if someone um, needs that type of assistance. So we are able to help for 90 days. A person is eligible once every 12 months. So if they apply now in April and we, we assist them, then they would be eligible again next April for assistance. Um, and I think that is the end of the presentation. Oh no, I was going to show you how to access the application, I'm sorry. Um, so I put the links on this um, presentation so that you can access the link um access the application through the link you can as community partners you can help your clients your participants submit an application we just ask that you include your name and agency in the information box so i'm going to pull it up so that you can see how you can access it um, when you're working with your participants hopefully it works for me so the link on the presentation will take you to this screen and it'll show you apply for assistance. And you scroll down. Nicole, this, I'm you, sorry. Might to, you might have to switch which screen you're sharing. Oh, I do? Okay, I'm sorry. Let's see. Stop sharing. Sorry, thank you, Katie. Yes, we're always navigating new things with Zoom. Okay, are we there now? Perfect. Thank Great. you. Great. Thank you. So the link that's in the presentation will lead you here, which is apply for assistance. So this shows you how to apply for all the programs that DHS offers. If you scroll down to how to apply for emergency assistance, you will see this box that will highlight in blue. You click that box and it will take you directly to the online emergency assistance application. And so then you would help um, your customer fill this form out. You would put their name and information and have them answer the questions for you. And then in this box here is where we would need an explanation of what they're looking for and then also your information as a contact person that assisted them. Um, so that is the link. I'm going to stop sharing. And if anyone has any questions, I'll be glad to answer them for you. Thank you. Yeah, let's take just a couple of minutes. If you have any questions for Nicole, we can leave it open so she can answer them for you. Alrighty, well, hearing none, thank you so much, Nicole, for being able to share that information with us. We're so excited to have these uh, resources and please feel free, um, everyone, to reach out if you have any other additional questions as that comes up in your assistant. Can I ask a quick plan. question? Oh, yes, please. Sorry. Um, so if, so I've lived in Adams County, but I've since moved to Denver um, several months ago. My mm -hmm. ID still says Adams County. Am I able to apply still or not? Yes, you can apply even though your ID has a different address on it. It's the lease agreement that we would go by. Okay. Perfect. Well, I'm month to month now because the lease is up. Okay, that's but, okay. We'll, okay. We'll, Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions?
Alrighty. Well, thank you so much, Nicole. That was really helpful. Um, and we are excited to be able to access those services for our clients, um, especially in these times of high rent costs. We know that that is definitely an issue. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that resource. Uh, next up, we have Rachel Flank Goldberg with DHS, who's going to be sharing some very exciting news about some community grants that we have. So Rachel, if you're ready, I'm going to turn it over to you. We have Rachel on the line. Hi, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Technical difficulties this morning. But um, thank you so much for sticking with us today. I'm Rachel, our grants manager here at Denver Human Services. I am gonna just pull up a quick slide to share with you all that has an overview of our new community grant funding initiative, which I am very excited to um, share for the first time. And I must admit, Zoom sharing is a little new to me. Um, there we go. Oh, Katie, it looks like I'm not able to share my screen, but that's okay. Um, I will just go ahead. So anyways, thank you guys again. Um, so we are going to be launching a community grant opportunity um, this is the first of its kind. Uh, Rachel, oh, yeah. uh, I just made you a co-host, so you can oh, okay. share your screen. Yep, sorry about okay. that. No problem. I will do that then. Can you see that now, David? I, I can. Okay, great. So I, I assume everyone else can too. So again, um, we are going to be launching on our website on April 12th, a community grant opportunity. And um, this is you know, also gonna go out through the community network newsletter, as well as marketing and communication channels in both Spanish and English. But um, you guys get a kind of like a heads up scoop. So um, lucky for you guys being on the call. Really this grant program has been designed um, in response to the fact that we know that our community members and our community-based organizations have been struggling and so what we're looking to do is partner with small scale community-based organizations with operating budgets under $1 million. Grants will be available up to $10,000 per organization. And what we're looking to do is fund priority areas in these um, three focus areas. So the first one is community organization capacity building. The second is um, social justice and community cohesion. And the third is supporting resilient communities. So I'll give you a little bit, um, some examples, a little bit more background information on each of these topics. And again, we will have um, much more extensive information on our website when the application is live on the 12th. But um, with our capacity building focus area, we're looking to um, improve an organization's effectiveness and ability to achieve its mission and improve outcomes for clients. So examples of um, funding opportunities that we you know, would like to see applications on are um, initiatives that reduce the digital divide for clients, uh, employing training such as trauma-informed care, two generational approaches to service delivery. Um, another training opportunity could be uh, eliminating cultural biases in your programs and services. And then also just making strategic investments in your organization so that you can increase sustainability of one's organization. In social justice, we are looking to fund grassroots uh, resident-led initiatives that bring people together to work on common principles of social justice and community cohesion. So examples there um, could be equity, diversity, and inclusion training, um, empowerment and community art based projects, youth leadership development and mentoring programs, and projects that increase the access for those um, individuals that have been historically marginalized. And finally, our supporting resilient communities funding area um, is, is just a community focused effort to help Denver residents build healthy, safe and resilient lives. So examples there could be um, mobile door to door food delivery, or um, culturally responsive food options in food banks, um, supporting expecting and new parents and their children, 
urban community gardens that help reduce food security and improving access to physical and mental, mental fitness opportunities. So um, I will also, once this opportunity is live, be hosting a Q&A session that will take place on April 20th. There will be a pre-registration link there. So after the application is available, if you know questions arise, again, I will be happy to answer those at the April 20th Q&A. But then also, you know, if things come up, um, my email will be uh, on the application as well. So you can reach out to me at any time. But this is a new opportunity for DHS. And we're just really looking forward to partnering with organizations that we might not have been able to in the past. So um, if there's any questions now, I'm happy to answer. Otherwise, look out for more information to come. Great. Thank you so much, Rachel. I am really excited about this. I know that when we were doing our community conversations, we heard loud and clear that CBOs need some more funding um, and some more support there. And so I think this is just such a great way of um, bringing that in and helping those who are already ingrained in the community and doing such great work there. So I really appreciate that. Um, if anybody, does anyone have any questions for Rachel at this time? All righty. Well, April 12th, we will be super excited to see that on the website and be able to um, chime in with that Q&A session. I'm sorry again to do this. I have a quick question. So there, um, there are a lot of organ, like a lot of mutual aid groups in Denver that have been helping provide, um, you know, supplies and food and stuff for people experiencing homelessness. Um, most of them are not like a formal nonprofit, but they're certainly doing um, on the ground work and saving lives. Is there a, an avenue for them applying um, or organizations that are kind of more uh, less formal and they don't have like the 503B status? I think if you could um, send me an email and um, Katie or David, if, if you could put my email in the chat, let's talk about that specific situation. Sure. Um, we do need to be able to um, have in a, an agreement with an organization, so a purchase order. So we do need to have the entity registered with the city and county of Denver. But, um, but let's talk about what that specific situation is and see what we can do. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks so much again, Rachel. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to um, just closing us out and sharing a little bit more about the meetings that we have coming up. So eh, there we go. Uh, so we have a couple of different community network meetings coming up as Patrice shared with us in the beginning. Um, we'll be doing every quarter will be DHS program updates just like today was. And then in the in-between we'll have topic based um, meetings. And so for our one that's coming up, we'll be doing immigrant and refugee resources, particularly pertaining to public charge DACA and our Denver Immigrant Legal Defense Fund, um, as well as language equity and some amazing organizations that are doing a great job of including um, several several languages rather um, in reaching their uh, clients and participants, um, specifically showcasing Denver Health and the, the work that they've been doing with getting information out about the vaccine. Um, and then also the city of Denver is going to be um, having Claudia Castillo talk a little bit about the language toolkit that she has and just the different work that the city is going to be doing around language equity moving forward. So if any of these topics um, look interesting to you and you have a specific suggestion, please know that I'm always open to that feedback um, so that we can make sure we have speakers there that are um, pertaining to your needs and your questions and the things that you're wrestling with um, as far as the, you know, the different types of struggles that you might be having and working with your community um, and any topics that you really want to see. My hope is that in the topic-based meetings, we'll have an opportunity at the end to have a breakout session so that you can sit with the speakers that we had and just get into some more nitty gritty um, details about that and really talk about the different obstacles that you're facing. Um, and so before I close it out, if you have any specific comments for immigrant and refugee resources that you believe are missing in your community, I would love if you could just drop that in the chat 
Um, that'll help make sure that we're touching um, everything that we need to in that meeting and being able to offer up the opportunity for you to connect. So feel free to drop any of your comments in the chat for any missing resources that you believe um, we don't have for the immigrant and refugee community. Um, and with that, I'll give everyone a couple of minutes uh, just to peruse the meetings that we have coming up and then uh, we will close us out. So thank you all so much. And thank you to all of our presenters that were here today.